So it's not an ego thing. It's not something you go, oh, I was there. Nobody can take my position. Uh, nobody can do it better. If you've left a place and then it collapses and nothing moves, then you are not a good administrator because there must be continuity of every legacy that you have left behind. There must be someone to take over and continue from there so that even though your absence is felt, the things you have put in place are actually still running and they are functioning. If you're not constantly investing in them, then you're undoing your organization because it's better to train them and have them use the skills to work with you for, let's say, two, three years, and then they leave for another organization, which you may not like, than for them to stay with you for 10 years and be untrained. The truth is, uh, I think one of the fears the managers or school owners have about training is, oh, they will eventually leave to another school, and then I'll lose all the money. Uh, training doesn't have to cost you so much. I hear that some school, in some schools, people just wake up and resign. I've heard of even people telling me that they started a job and they were not given a letter of employment. They were not given a contract, no terms of reference. So what do you expect from such people? They can only do what they imagine to be the right thing. Please, when you start a school, don't just do it for the fun of it. It is a business and every business, every organization has a structure for it to run effectively. So you must have your laid down policies and procedures for how things are done so that decisions are not taken, um, you know, um, based on, um, uh, on feelings or, or favoritism or, or, you know, on sentiment. When people are not listened to, they find a way to express themselves. I mean, the opportunity is not given, then they go to social media. There are some schools who have had similar problems and nobody heard about it, maybe because of how it was handled. But I think uh, I, I do not subscribe to people going to social media to you know, talk about things that happen internally in schools. It's like a husband and wife having issues and then you're going to social media to spread it all over. It gets complex because the cut of social media is, is based on sentiments. They don't care about facts. Hello, thank you for joining us. This is the Education Podcast by Edith Solo. I'm your host, Abdi Salam Amor. In this edition, we have been joined by Mrs. Nancy Epwazu, who is a lead consult at uh, Pezu Smith Consulting. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon, Mr. Amor. Thank you for joining us. So we'll be looking into matters in relation to educational administration, which has been uh, focus in the past uh, two to three decades. So first of all, how do we ensure that the work culture in schools is good? Um, I think that the work culture in some schools is actually already good, um, but there's still a lot of concern in quite a number of schools. And one of the things um, I've noticed is that school owners um, recruit Agila do not have much, um, um, do they do not have clear cut policies for recruitment, or they do not bother getting the right consultants to get the right staff for them. And then there's also the issue of uh, manpower development, capacity building. So schools recruit people, they do not have policies, they do not have any structure, some do not even bother giving a job description and they want to run it like maybe it's a kitchen or something that they're running. And so that also determines the work culture of the people that you recruit. Because when there's proper administration and management, it impacts on the culture of the organization. Because the truth is, is the administrator or the manager or the school owner that is actually the custodian of the, of the culture of the organization. So you set the tone by how you're able to build um, processes and structure in place. And if there's no structure, no proper training, nobody knows what to do, people will only come with their preconceived notions or their previous experiences, which may not be best practices. So if you're going to promote best practices in a school, there must be, first of all, proper, a proper structure, which is one of the things my organization actually does for schools. You must have structure. What's your vision? Where are you heading to? 
what kind of people do you need to run the team? And when they come in, do you have any, any gaps that you've noticed? Do you train them and retrain and make sure that everybody's on the same page? An organization that does not even have an onboarding process will never be able to achieve a strong culture because people come with ideas. The fact that they, they did it in a certain way in their former schools, they are going to bring in there. So if you hire people from maybe four different organizations, they are going to come in with four different ideas about how the organization should run. So if there's nobody to coordinate them, nobody to show them the proper way, no proper onboarding, no proper process, no structure, no proper even recruitment um, procedures, then there's going to be a problem. I hear that some school in some schools people just wake up and resign. I've heard of even people telling me that they started a job and they were not given a letter of employment. They were not given a contract, no terms of reference. So what do you expect from such people? They can only do what they imagine to be the right thing. And based on their assumptions, and in management, we say that assumptions are the lowest form of information. So if people are acting based on the barest level of uh, um, information, which is assumption, then there will be a problem. And that's what leads to a lot of all the toxicity, a lot of the war between school owners and, um, and their employees, and, and even in-house among the employees. There's a lot of um, there are different kinds of issues that they cope with. You know and all of that so if there are no if there's no structure then the grapevine takes over and it becomes a toxic work culture because everybody wants to do their thing and everybody sees the lapses and the gaps in the system and so they just want to take advantage of it so what i will advise is please when you start a school don't just do it for the fun of it it is a business and every business every organization has a structure for it to run effectively so you must have your laid down policies and procedures for how things are done so that decisions are not taken, um, you know, um, based on, um, uh, on feelings or, or favoritism or, or, you know, on sentiment. They are, they are taken based on structure, based on the policies, based on the procedures that have been laid down in the organization, which help in actually getting things going, such that even if you as the owner are not there, things can move fine. So, so I think taking, it's basically it a lack there. of structure, yeah. So taking it from there, how can school managers be effective in their jobs? Um, school managers can be effective on their jobs in several ways. The first of all is even to recognize why you're going into it. Are, are you the right fit for that job? Because it's a, I've been a school man, uh, administrator or manager in about four schools, and people think it's just fun to be called that title. It's a lot of work. The first thing you need to be first know is whether you are even in the right career path. Because no matter how much you know um, in your head knowledge, you will not be effective on that job because it's a hard job. It's a job that involves, it takes the whole of you. It's actually not a job, it's a calling, I must say. It's something that you do with all of yourself, you know? So you first have to know whether it's even, you're even on the right job. Are you the right fit for it? Then secondly, do a, a SWOT analysis of yourself as a school manager or an administrator. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And what exactly are the threats, you know, against all of these things? And what are the opportunities you can harness as an individual? So for the gaps, you you have a, you there are so many resources online, online courses, there are coaches. I personally um, coach people, I train them and I, I mentor administrators, even though I've been doing it one-on-one. -on -one. Right now I'm starting an academy in January on the third. I'm called the Connected School Leaders um, uh, Academy. So you can you can um leverage you know a whole lot of all the resources available and the coaches are available to train yourself, to always know that you can be better, okay? The administration has gone beyond um, just doing things anyhow. And there, there are no excuses for any school administrators in 2021 and beyond because we have a vast array of resources at our disposal. And some are even free, some are paid. So you have to continually develop yourself. There are books everywhere. I have a book for administrators called the, um, 
uh, administrators, companion, and there's even another one coming to um, help schools that have problems with their boarding houses. So you can't, there's no excuse at all not to perform excellently on your job because we have all the resources at our disposal. Another thing that will help is for the predecessor to always have a proper handover note so that there's continuity. I recall when I resigned from one of my job positions, I left a handover note that was about 50 pages and people thought, oh, why will you do that? Why will you go to that extent to write um, a handover note that is as much as 50 pages? Don't you have other things to do with your life? And then I left a, a, my email address and my phone number so that the administrator taking over from me could actually continue from where I stopped. So it's not an ego thing. It's not something you go, oh, I was there. Nobody can take my position. Uh, nobody can do it better. If you've left a place and then it collapses and nothing moves, then you are not a good administrator because there must be continuity of every legacy that you have left behind. There must be someone to take over and continue from there so that even though your absence is felt, the things you have put in place are actually still running and they are functioning. So I think also a succession plan will be very good. And then administrators leaving should make sure that they have proper handover notes detailing everything that the next person needs to know to help them function effectively on that job, which will include what they have achieved, um, the uh, challenges they faced, how far they went solving them, and the ones that are remaining that the next person needs to take over from. So the, those are some of the things, because some people take on a new role as administrators and see nothing left from the previous person who was there to guide them. That's not being professional. Professionalism means that you want the best for that organization, whether you have taken your exit or not. And you have left something that can guide the other person coming in to function effectively. All right. Thank you very much. So that. those tips I have just shared, I think that will, those will really help anybody at all um, to function well. One thing, to, one thing we can pick up from what you just said now is that school administrators should ensure that once they, when they leave the position, the, the institution doesn't collapse. So exactly. Move, so exactly. Moving, yes, moving on from that, we really, we have the teachers in schools. There is this challenge of school manage, managers training teachers. In some cases, some teachers don't even have, have access to training at all. Or some schools believe that once they train a teacher, uh, the teacher would leave the school and go elsewhere and such things like that. How can the school be effectively run without this? Uh, we now ask a question of how schools can be effectively run when the teachers are not up to date with the trainings of their profession. So how can teach, how can school managers balance this quest to retain teachers and build the capacity of teachers? Well, first of all, any organization that does not want to train their teachers or any staff at all, it's not only the teachers, even cleaners, caterers, nurses, they all need to be trained. So any organization that does not want to invest in the professional development of their teachers or their staff or employees, that organization is doing it to their own peril. Because the worst thing you can have is a set of people that, are, that stay with you for so long and are not productive, or they, they are just there marking time and collecting salaries. If you're not constantly investing in them, then you're undoing your organization because it's better to train them and have them use the skills to work with you for let's say two, three years, and then they leave for another organization, which you may not like, than for them to stay with you for 10 years and be untrained. Because the truth is, uh, I think one of the fears the managers or school owners have about training is, oh, they'll eventually leave to another school and then I'll lose all the money. Uh, a training doesn't have to cost you so much. If you have a proper um, uh, professional development plan for your organization, you will realize that some of the trainings that your organization needs can actually be done in-house. Some of the stuff that you're, you're looking down on have far more than you think they do. Some of them can train right in-house and, and, and help others to upskill. 
But you see, because we do not think, we do not think holistically about professional development, we always think that we must have an external consultant or trainer who would come and do it and charge you so much money. And by the way, even among consultants, there are some that are very affordable and are very good. Like my services are tailored for every kind of school. So if I'm dealing with a highbrow school where there are fees are millions, I know what to charge them because of the way I'll deliver and the kind of resources I'll bring, maybe the kind of workbooks I'll tailor to meet their needs. And then there are those who cannot even afford, you know, I've even done a training for a school. They didn't believe it. And I charged so little. They were like, wow, we we're so scared to contact you. And we didn't know you'd be affordable. So I, mean, I think people just have a preconceived notion that training is so expensive and it is not because the training can be tailored to the needs of each school and based on what you charge and what your school can afford a training can be tailored to meet your needs so and then of course so any teacher who is waiting to be trained by the school all of the time has a problem in 2021 because there are no excuses at all we have a wide range of resources online. We have online courses that are totally free, sponsored by very reputable organizations. And some you don't have to pay a cover, unless maybe you want the certificate delivered to you, maybe from the UK or US or Ireland or whichever organization is organizing it. I personally referred people to a few organizations and they were able to get very top training. And, and take on their self-paced online courses that helps to develop them and they're able to function well. So it's a two-way thing. The school, the teacher should not wait for the school because by the way, even when schools um, train you, they will never be able to meet your own unique, peculiar needs as an individual. They'll train you for what you need to deliver to the organization. And so you should also have your own personal development plan, apart from the school's professional development plan. You should have your own professional development plan as an individual. What are my gaps? What are the areas I need to work on? Uh, what, where can I get the resources? How much do they even cost? Can I access free ones? For example, for school administrators, I have a, web, a, a monthly webinar that I do now. Every month I choose the topic, and then people register. I started it two months ago and I've already had two sessions. If I one held uh, on Saturday, just two days ago, and I talked on report writing for administrators and managers. And I make it very affordable because I know this is something you can invest in every month, at least cover a little part of your salary so that at the end of the year, you've done 12 courses and wow, you're far, far more equipped and even um, up your, uh, bargaining power with any employer because you're bringing in so much value. You're knowledgeable, you're skilled, you have someone in your network who can guide you, whom you can refer to when there are problems. I mean, come on. There are also academies. I have one. I know a few other professionals in the uh, other administrators and consultants that have such um, um, mentoring programs. Mine is going to start on the 10th of January and will run for three months. I intend to do that every three months to have new cohorts where I can take on, uh, you know, and really equip school administrators and managers with the skills and knowledge and share my experience with them. So to really build them up. The same with teachers, there are also people having mentoring academies for teachers. So you can re-enroll for them. So you don't need, as a manager or an administrator, you don't need to wait for your employers to equip you. So even if the school owners have failed, what about you? Even as the administrator, if this, if the, or the school owner does not approve your uh, recommendations for training, then you can start with what you have. You can start with the online courses. You can go and enroll somewhere and train yourself, and then come and train the staff, and have regular times where you meet with them. And then if there are free courses, you can send them. So you do that. You also refer them to the internet and all the you know, wide uh, ranges of courses that we have, and then let them take from there. So no excuses at all. And to the school owners who do not want to invest, you're not doing your organization any good. Because any staff that would not train and would stay with you from one, from one year to another and remain there for five, six, seven years is not somebody that you should keep. If you're just joining us, we are still on the Education Podcast by the Senate. 
um, we've been talking about educational management. Moving from where you just stopped now, Madam, you, the, the, there is this issue around the teacher parent uh, relationship. How can this be managed effectively? Well, it still boils down to having clear cut policies. At the, when, a, when a school admits parents, um, admits students into, the, into a school, they should have meetings with their parents to let them know what is accepted and what is not in terms of relating with the staff. When a school has, there's something I do in schools, uh, it's called coffee with the administrator. And so when, when we have new intakes, we have a time when I take them through um, our policies, what we believe in, what we don't, the boundaries between the staff and them. So that those, no parent comes in harassing the staff or coming to want to bribe them or, you know, um, treat them in a certain way. So everything boils down to structure. Like I said earlier, the same thing with relating with the school owners and the, and the employees is the same thing that applies to relating with parents and the employees. So it's the same thing. Once the structure and the boundaries are clearly stated, then it becomes easier for the um, for both parties to line up. What would be your advice for somebody just starting up a school? For someone just starting a school, please don't start a school based on assumptions because that would be very, very erroneous. Um, people start think that I mean, school is um, some kind of thing you just get into after your retirement and then relax. It is far more work than you can imagine. So start a school and then do it based on knowledge. Ensure you do a feasibility study of the area where you are. Ensure that you get someone to guide you. You can interview other school owners who are willing to open up about the details of running a school get the right books, join the right associations, and hire a consultant if you can to really put you through. I just came back from Abuja where I guided a school owner. I was there for three months um, for a school that was just um, starting. I mean, you had to go through the stages of, you know, um, putting the school in place. So get a, a, a competent consultant if you can, so that they can help you build structure and guide you and then you also save money on spending on the wrong thing because some people have their ideas about how their schools should be and uh, maybe the location doesn't quite fit that or the budgeting is wrong or they are coming in with um, things that, are, that cannot really fly in the education sector or whatever or they think school should be the same old way that they did uh, 40 years ago you know so that they will have um, current ideas and what the expectations are as regards the registration, as regards building structure, as regards marketing, as regards recruitment, and of course, as regards having proper policies, um, procedures, uh, your procurement procedures, and a whole lot of things to get it going, your curriculum, and all of the activities that you'll be doing. So get a consultant if you can afford one. It will save you a whole lot of stress and trouble. And that person will act as a sounding board for your decision making. Yeah. So um, the importance of consultants cannot be overemphasized in what you, from what you said so far. So how do school manage school leaders and manage the work life balance? How do we really maintain a work life balance? Well, as a school leader, you just need to know when to unplug. When I was in active service, you know, heading schools, being a teacher. I must, I must confess that I constantly had a burnout. And that's because I'm, I'm actually a workaholic. I mentioned that in one of my books, um, Dear Educator, how I worked for two years without taking a break and the effect it had on my health and my productivity at the end of the day. So don't think that you'll be productive if you go year in, year out without taking a holiday. If you can afford a vacation, please go on a vacation. And if you can, uh, maybe um, take time off and learn to have a hobby and have other people you can talk to so that you can unburden. Because as a school manager or leader or an administrator, it can be quite stressful and the job is never ending. So if you don't close your laptop once in a while and just take a break, um, you will never have the time to do it. So you have to schedule in breaks into your 
your schedule, have breaks into your schedule, vacation. If you can travel out of the country, by all means do it and take a vacation. If you cannot, and what you can do is the neighboring city or even just places for sightseeing where you are, that would be great. Get a hobby. If you swim, please make the time to do it and relax. If you're the type that likes to go clubbing, whatever works for you, please do it so that you can let down your hair once in a while. And I would advise that you don't take too much work every day. Um, you know, these days your office is right on your laptop. So the temptation is to open it any time of the day and just keep working and working endlessly. Um, also prioritize your family. You have your job, you have your family, you have your spiritual life, you have your health. Try to find a balance, you know, amongst the various aspects of your life that are very important. Because at the end of the day, it's not all about just work, work, work. You're also a human being. You need to be nurtured. You need to have time for your family and your children. You need to have time to rest. You need to have time for God. If you're a Muslim, a Christian, or whatever religion you belong to, to also have time for all of this. So yes, work-life balance is very important uh, and you can juggle it the way that it suits you. So what works for one person may not work for another. For me, I find relaxing, even though I'm reading, reading non-professional books, that can be a form of relaxing, just having a popcorn, relaxing. Like yesterday, I went to the movies. I had time to just go and you know watch a movie and relax. I'll have popcorn, have a smoothie here and there. All those things are very important because they help to um, re-energize you and get you ready to work again when you're back. So please make the best of your midterm break and don't spend it all working on working because if you drop that, the work goes on. So I believe that what you just said applies to teachers as well. Oh yes, it does. It does. So who should be the ideal teacher school manager should employ? The ideal person would be someone who is constantly learning and improving on him or herself. This is the 21st century. I had a session on Saturday where I taught school managers and administrators how to write proper professional reports. You know, what kind of, not progress reports for students, you know, reports that come from a manager or an administrator. And I was surprised one of them that asked me whether she could write the reports with pen and paper. And I said, no, not in 2021. So the skills, to be someone who has the skills to actually deliver on the job and someone who is constantly learning on learning and relearning because I mean, life is so dynamic and everything is changing at such a fast pace. You cannot afford to have someone who is stuck in his or her ways and is always wanting to do things the same old way that it was done years ago. Such a person has been left back in the Rockies and would lose relevance, of course. It has already lost relevance get somebody who is not losing relevance and is bringing in value to you. And can also work in a team, has emotional intelligence, understands the first century teaching and learning, is up to date with technology, and knows you know, about global perspectives and things that are going on. I'm not a, what we call a local champion. Yeah, that's the kind of person I would recommend. Okay. From there, we we'll talk about um measuring teachers' performance, how can this be measured? Well, um, in, um, um, two months ago, I taught um, a, a webinar. I facilitated a webinar where I taught school administrators and school owners how to measure the performance of the various cadres of staff in a school, the various cadres of employees. And I took them through my, my six-step um, process that I have developed. And it's something that I would recommend. You can visit my website, www.nancyakwezu.com to watch the replay for a token. And um, one of the things that will help is to have lay, cut out uh, parameters and make sure that at the beginning of the school year, you set goals with everybody. First, let's even go through the process. First, make sure they have, they understand your school's vision and mission. They have their job descriptions and they understand it. In addition, you have goals. Uh, everybody knows who their line manager is, who is going to evaluate me at the end of the year. Because the truth is, you'd be surprised how some schools just do things. They don't, at the end of the year, they say, okay, um, 
you heard of uh, uh, languages, go and evaluate this person. And the person is wondering, I didn't know anything. How can someone from the blues just come and evaluate me, you know? And then make sure that you set goals with them, understand what their key performance indicators are, understand what the expectations are, and how are you going to measure them? Then develop and make sure everybody on this does this with their line manager. Then develop the criteria in a template. All of this must be known to both the person and um, uh, both the employer, the line manager, and the employee, so that there are no um, gray areas. Everybody's clear. So and then it helps. And then with effective communication, you are able to know when they are achieving and when they are not. So for schools, I'll advise that you have periodic appraisals. Don't wait until the end of the school year before you start appraising everybody. Start appraising termly. If you want the British curriculum or Nigerian, you have three terms. So each term have an appraisal session. And in between, make sure that there's ongoing communication between you and your line manager. And you're constantly um, looking and checking to see whether you are meeting those um those um, evaluation criteria or not and then at the end of the school year you have a summative appraisal that shows everything that has happened in the school year and it's properly documented and uh, weighted and then you can have uh, maybe tips or perks and uh, rewards and recognition done from those results and also be able to draw out information to know where which areas your staff need training and where they need improvement and also how you as an organization um, are performing um, in terms of your uh, uh, meeting your objectives and your goals. So that's just a summary, but I have a full detailed um, webinar where I touched on these very um, in details. And you might want to visit my website, www.nancyakpezu.com to access it and um, get it for a token, yeah. So from there, we were really touched on um, a book you're writing about hostel management or boarding school management. So can you give us some tips on properly managing boarding schools? Okay, my book, Effective Boarding House Management, will be out anytime soon. I already have two books, by the way, Dear Educator and the School Administrator's Companion. And in the School Administrator's Companion, I did mention a, um, a chap, I did dedicate a chapter to performance management. So you might also want to get that to improve your performance management in your school as an administrator. Now to my book, The uh, boarding, Effective Boarding House Management, I realized that a lot of schools have problems. You know, I run a Facebook group where we have about 13,000 members and I get in boxes all the time. Oh, I was asked to go on a, um, supervise the kids in the boarding house. I don't know anything about it. I was not trained. I don't know what to do. Or some schools would tell me the boarding house does not even have um, a living um, supervisor, that the children are left there after 9 p.m. after prep to stay on their own till the next morning. I'm like, what? Who does that? So they were all facts I gathered from um, bits here and there. And that gave me a picture of what is really going on in some schools. The fact that I have run a school, I've run four schools, three of which were boarding houses, and we were able to do it effectively with no standards. We had policies, we had handbooks, we had guidelines, and then we had to train the staff on what is required to run a boarding house. To my surprise, a lot of schools have never trained their staff. They think that the training is only for teachers. And so I decided to come up with this book to address the issues in our boarding houses, and also to equip school owners, school administrators, school managers, or anybody at all, boarding house marshals, boarding house their parents, boarding house mistresses, boarding house masters, everybody who will be working in a boarding house, what exactly it takes to want a boarding house, from the kind of policies you have, to the things you should avoid, to the ones you should not, to the kind of facilities, to the kind of customer service you should render, how to develop relationship with students. A whole lot is covered in this book and is going to be out in the first quarter of 2022. Or it may even come out before then because it's already back from my editor and it's with my publisher already. So I should be making that announcement anytime from now. So schools that have a boarding house, please watch out for that book and get your copy. It will save you from a whole lot of trouble. 
You've seen schools going on air for bad, uh, poor publicity, poor customer service, and being in the news, and you end up losing students when you don't know what you're doing. So all of the things you should put in place, from child safety to safeguarding, all of that is included. The documents you should have, all, all of the things. Should you give medicines to kids in the boarding house? Should you not? What should the nurse do? A whole, whole, whole lot is covered in this book. And I cannot wait to release it to the public because of the importance it is. So it's not a book that I'm writing to make money. It's actually to address issues. And if you read any of my books, it's written in clean, clear, everyday language, very easy to understand. And I put the most serious things out in plain, everyday language, devoid of professional jargon that will make you sleep when you're reading it. So it's a book you want to flip over and keep reading and reading. It's, going, it's your guide for running your boarding houses. And you must have a copy if you're a boarding school. You've surely touched on so many, so many things in the course of this uh, podcast. So in relation to what you just mentioned about the management of boarding houses, we have this issue of the social media giving schools bad publicity. The, uh, this earlier in the year, we had one in Uyo, where the school, well, as the management of a body of a boarding school led to a school having bad publicity on the social media. And one which much recent, about uh, less than a week ago, um, yeah. in, in reference to one actress in Nigeria. So, how can school managers properly manage such situations, such embarrassing situations? Well, I think it also has to do with the kind of relationship that you develop with your clients. When people are not listened to, they find a way to express themselves. I mean, the opportunity is not given, then they go to social media. There are some schools who have had similar problems and nobody heard about it, maybe because of how it was handled. But I think uh, I, I do not subscribe to people going to social media to you know, talk about things that happen internally in schools. It's like a husband and wife having issues and then you're going to social media to spread it all over. It gets complex because the cut of social media is, is based on sentiments. They don't care about facts. Everybody will just get there and start writing the next thing they are abusing schools. Some might actually be competitors of that school who want to run the other school down and they, they write anything. So it's neither here nor there. But I, my recommendation would be to have proper customer service so that your customers, the parents, your clients are confident enough to approach you on issues, no matter how sensitive, keep an, keep an opening ear uh, and, and, and make sure that you listen, listen, keep an a listening ear and attend to issues promptly. It's one of the tenets of customer service. But when they are not happy or they don't feel or they are neglected, then they might just go to social media. And if the person is an influencer, like what happened recently, then the news will go and go with everywhere and everybody's making their contribution. Some that do not even know the basis of it. And sometimes you might not even have the clear facts of what really happened because that might just be an outburst of anger or sentiments and it will go viral. Meanwhile, that might not be the exact thing that happened. It might not be the exact picture. So everybody will paint their own picture and it becomes complex to handle. And people now form their judgments and opinions and perspectives and start sharing and everybody wants to say something. Because when such things happen, they help to promote your algorithm on, on social media. So everybody takes advantage of it. So I think customer service would help, proper communication. If such a parent was called right away and the issue was addressed, I do not think that it would have got to social media. All right. So from there, we go back to teachers. Earlier, you made, you made some reference to teachers that were not properly employed. Where we, we have situations where teachers are not issued letters of employment or some other things of, of, of such. So how can, what's your advice for such teachers? And how can this teachers cope in such situations? First of all, teachers should also know their rights. I can't imagine myself getting an employed by an organization and we do not have terms of reference. Because it shows um, how they rate themselves. You shouldn't work in a school that does not give you job descriptions, doesn't give you a letter of employment, what you're meant to do. There should be some kind of um, you know, terms of reference. I recruit, I've recruited for schools recently, 
And if I was a consultant, an in-house consultant in one of the schools, and one of the first things we do is to ensure that we have you know, we engage you properly and even take you through an onboarding process uh, where you're made to understand the vision of the school, what we stand for, the core values, our philosophy, our mission, what drives us, what our unique selling points are, and what you're expected to do. In addition, you should have performance management um, properly set. Your criteria for evaluation. Wow, how are you going to be evaluated on this job? So, my advice to teachers is insist on things being done properly because it takes two to tango. If these if the school owners do not know any better, then you are a professional and you should advise. I expect teachers to say, Oh, um, you're asking me to resume. May I have my letter of employment? And what are the terms of my engagement? What am I entitled to? What am I leave? Uh, when will I have a leave? Is it when the children go? How many days can I take a casual leave? You should understand the policies for the organization you're working. Because if you do not, then you will come in with any assumption. That's why somebody can wake up one day and say, oh, my grandmother is sick in the village and take off without a leave request. And then the owner is wondering, why are you taking time off without a request? Meanwhile, you didn't give the person any job description and there are no policies guarding leave management. So if you are a professional, the teachers will be unprofessional. So for teachers, be a professional one and ask for all of these things. So um, as we conclude the uh, discussion this, the, uh, this period, I would just like you to tell us more about uh, what your organization does, the Fezu Smith Consulting. Oh, it's always my pleasure to talk about Fezu Smith Consulting. Uh, Pezu Smith Consulting is a, is a consulting firm started by me, Nancy Ekpezu. Um, and we are, we, we, what we do is that we, we ensure there's proper administration and management in your organization. We help with school startups. We do admin audits. We train school managers, school administrators. We coach and train school owners. We help you put your policies and procedures in place. Uh, policies that guide parents, about students, about the staff. And then we also help to everything admin, uh, record keeping, filing, um, performance management, uh, customer service. So those are uh, professional ethics. Those are the core of the things that we do. In addition, we produce books that are tailored to um, educating um, educators, but mainly for managers and administrators. And then we also have online courses. I have quite a number of them on my website, www.nancyekpezu.com. And in addition, I'm introducing my, uh, my latest baby, which is the um, Connected School Administrators Academy, COSA, which is starting on the 3rd of January, 2022. And people are already enrolling. So the first cohort starts um, from 3rd of January, 2022 through um, to the 31st of March. And the next one will start in April and run for three months. So in a month, in a year, I intend to have about three or four cohorts, depending on the enrollment. And um, so far, so good. People are already responding since I put the advert out last week. So I hope to use this opportunity to train and mentor school administrators, school owners, and school managers and teachers who intend to rise up to the management position. Because one of the gaps I have noticed is that quite a number of teachers are training themselves or teaching in the classroom. And when they begin to excel on those positions, then school owners, in a bit to reward them, will move them on to start leading the school without equipping them. And so they get there to their shock and dismay to find out that the, the skills that help them in the classroom have not helped them on the administration job because it's a complete level of, of skills, a complete skill set that you need to manage people. When you are in the classroom, you're doing your job, you're getting appraised, you're dealing with students and sometimes parents, depending on the school policies. But when you are in admin or leadership and management, you're primarily dealing with the resources of the organization, the human resource, material resource, financial resource. And then the gap is so wide. And you see that people who have performed excellent in the classroom fail in school administration and management. 
not because they are bad, but because they were never trained. And this is going on in a lot of schools. And that causes a war between the administrators and the managers and, and the school owners. And so we need to, that is one of the reasons for this school to help to break that gap and make sure that anyone who is promoted from being a teacher to becoming a school administrator or a school owner is actually well equipped to function and also has support from people who have done it before and done it successfully. I've been a school administrator in four schools and on my last job, I did that in a multinational organization where I was the one reporting to the board. And I had all the heads of schools, the principal, the head of primary and the head of early years reporting to me. So I'll be sharing experientially what works, what best practices are, how to actually put a school together and run it effectively, how to understand your staff, team management, customer service, um, documentation, filing, communication, recruitment, a whole lot of things have been embedded into the curriculum of my robust curriculum for the um, Connected School Administrators Academy. And I cannot wait to start unleashing and you know getting these people out there. Because I, I, I also came to that conclusion when I was recruiting for schools. I've recruited for quite some top schools in Abuja and a few in Lagos. And during the interviews, uh, you see that there are school owners who are ready to pay good salaries for positions. I've recruited for a position where the salary was as much as 850,000 a month. And to get the right candidate was such a big issue because they were bringing skill sets of people who were in the range of 300,000. And we cannot entrust such positions to people who are not properly equipped and who are not knowledgeable about what school operations, what school management and administration is all about. So this will also help school owners so that I equip this set of people and then when they're in the labor market or when they need to have a switch or change of job, they can perform effectively and understand professionalism. And one of the advantages of working with me is that I'm known for integrity. My no is no and my yes is yes. And that's one of the core values of my organization. And that's also what I pass on to people because that's what I've lived in all the four schools where I have led as an administrator. So I expect that they come in at the end of the three months, understanding the level of professionalism that they need to take back to their jobs. And so that we can gradually, one at a time, change the face of administration and management in our schools, in our clients, yes. All right, then we have it, we've been, we've been about one hour of discussing effective school management. Most of what Chess is uh, Nancy has said, have been towards uh, private uh, schools. And I believe some of the some of the elements of what have been said apply to public schools as well. Like the issue of the just what you just said about the what about what you just said about uh, school money moving people from teaching from the classroom to, to the management level because they're performing well applies in many of our public schools as well. Where we have the in Lagos, for example, we have the education districts or we have the ministries in other parts of the country where people anybody that just it's just doing well, just take the person from the classroom, or depending on their politics, take the person from the classroom to the offices, and there, there we have a gap in either administration or teaching at the end of the day. So you, you, if you want to learn more about school administration, try checking our website, as you mentioned earlier, nancyforzoo.com, and try registering at the academy. Yes, on, yes. On this note, when this edition of the education podcast i've been your host abdul salam Amo. thank you very much for joining us Lamented. so when it comes to budget implementation especially in the education sector what we've seen over the years is that sometimes you get so there is the proposed amount and there is the released amount so most of the time what we realize is that Amount released, released funds at the end of the day is usually around 40%, 50% at most. 